Good morning and greetings to students, faculty, staff, and residents of Lewiston, Auburn, and beyond. Thank you for being here on such an empowering day. My name is Alexandria Shadera Anoa, and as a senior, this is my last MLK day here at Bates College. And as a black woman on this campus, this is one of my favorite events of the year because we honor the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We honor him today as a shining light for this country and as a reminder to fight against oppressive powers. He captivated millions of people with his eloquent voice and his message centered on equality for all. His legacy lives on. Dr. King was an advocate for human rights. He was also a leader of peaceful protests as seen in events such as the Selma to Montgomery March that took place on March 25th, 1965. In this march, MLK led thousands of people from citizens to clergy of different races to the capital in Montgomery, Alabama. This was a political march for black people to assert their constitutional right to vote and to exercise their right to have a voice as citizens and as humans. In response to these efforts, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This was a victory in what seemed to be a step in the right direction. But it wasn't that simple. If we rewind, the Selma to Montgomery March for Voting Rights was a series of protests in March 1965. On March 7, 1965, hundreds of civil rights marchers headed out for Selma, but were stopped at the Edmund Pettus Bridge and were violently attacked by local police, a day known as Bloody Sunday. Just as there were setbacks, including at least one violent setback on that journey, we are still on a journey to equal rights and treatment for all. And it is worth considering the many struggles black people are still facing in this country. For example, in January of 2018, the US Bureau of Justice Statistics reported that although African Americans and Latinos make up 29% of the US population, they make up 57% of the US prison population. Furthermore, Blacks and those from the Latinx community are more likely than whites to be arrested, convicted, and experience lengthy prison sentences. Our young ones are impacted by these injustices as well. Black children go missing at a higher rate than white children, and the news does a poor job of highlighting this fact. The FBI's National Crime Information Center database lists 424,066 missing children under 18 in the 2018, and about 37% of those children are black. Even though black children only make up about 14% of all children in the United States. I consider the previous facts as a way to encourage us to not stay silent. When we watch the news, when we read about the tragic events that are happening in this country to communities of color, we simply cannot be silent. It is our responsibility as members of this community to address these issues in order to find solutions. That is doing the work from the ground up. As you hear Professor Eberhardt deliver the keynote address, and as you walk around campus and participate in the various workshops and programming, I hope these experiences and interactions spark something inside of you that will encourage you to continue the work of Martin Luther King Jr. and speak out against injustice even when it may be uncomfortable. Thank you for your presence today and I hope you have a marvelous MLK Day. Thank you, Alex, um, for those incredibly incisive and compelling remarks. Let's give her one more round of applause. Good morning and welcome. Students, faculty, staff, students from surrounding communities. I know we've got some Camden students here, some Lewis and Auburn students, um, and then all other guests. It's Fabulous to have this big venue absolutely filled to the rafters. Um, on this day each year, we come together as a community here at Bates to honor the life and work of Dr. King, as well as those who worked alongside him and those who have furthered his legacy over the decades. This day is made possible only through the hard work of a great many members of the Bates community led by the MLK Planning Committee. 
I am very grateful to this year's co-chairs, Michael Sargent, Associate Professor of Psychology, and Susan Stark, Associate Professor of Philosophy, and to the entire committee. I also want to offer special thanks to Brenda Pelletier, who, along with staff from dining conferences and campus events, um, facility services and grounds, work like crazy to handle the arrangements and logistics for an event of this size that has things going on all day. So I'd like to thank them as well. I also want to thank uh, um, the students, faculty, staff, and guests from across the country who will be running workshops all day. You can see it every hour of the day and night, uh, sorry, of the day today and then with Sankofa tonight that we have a very robust slate of programming and this is typical and we invite everyone to attend. This year our theme as set by the planning committee is from the ground up inequity, bias, privilege, structure, death. Throughout the day, we will consider the systems and biases that create disparities and injustices throughout our society. Injustices in wealth, health, education, life expectancy, freedom, and security. We will look within to see how we as a community, this college, and higher education more broadly can do more to address the injustices baked into our institutions and structures of opportunity. We are fortunate to begin this work with our keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt of Stanford University, a distinguished scholar and teacher whose work focuses on the always complex, often unconscious ways that individuals assess and assign value to one another based on ideas of race. She also explores the consequences of this stereotyping within the criminal justice system, education, housing, immigration, and the workplace. Dr. Eberhardt will be more fully introduced by Michael Sargent in just a few minutes. As I prepared for this year's event, I spent some time reading Dr. Eberhardt's work and reflecting on the issues she engages. She is not merely an expert on racial bias. She has a singular ability to demonstrate through clinical study and critical analysis just how ingrained such bias is and how powerfully it dr dr drives our perceptions, thoughts, and actions. Her extraordinary scholarship serves as a reminder that the work against bias is all of ours and it is an ongoing effort. Here at Bates, it may help to remember that we are engaged in this work together, not just on days such as this, when we assemble in this space and at workshops across campus, but in all we do. Throughout the day today, in workshops, panels, and presentations, we will listen and learn together. From an ex exercise on the tools of anti-racism to a discussion of identity in the workplace to an environmental justice mapathon to the Bates-Morehouse debate this afternoon and the Sankofa performance this evening, the opportunities of the day ahead are rich and compelling. I hope that you will all take advantage of as many of them as possible. I will now turn things op over to Michael Sargent, who will introduce our guest. Thank you, Dr. Eber Eberhardt, and thank you all for being here. Good morning. We can do a little better than that. Let's try one more time. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. To students of the college, to my faculty and staff colleagues, to President Spencer, to all administration and trustees, to guests of the college, to our fellow Mainers, both those born here and those who have come from around the world to live here, I want to say how pleased I am to see you here on this day. I also want to acknowledge our elders, whose memory we sustain and whose legacy we embody, including indigenous elders whose land we are on today 
and our elders who were brought here in chains and whose forced labor was a foundation upon which these United States were built. As we gather, gather today, I recall beginning my Bates career in the fall of 1999, which, as one of my students recently reminded me, was before he was even born, so at least in student time, a long, long time ago. I recall learning then that we at Bates cancel classes on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, but I also recall having it drilled into me that it's a day on and not a day off. As tempting as it might be to sleep in or to venture out to play in the snow, to truly be a member of the Bates community is to engage with the events of this day. But what does it mean for this to be a day on? In what sense are we on? Obviously, it means that we remain active, we remain activated. But to what end? In my view, this is a day when we are on mission. That is to say, we remain aligned with the college's mission. In the closing words of our mission statement, with ardor and devotion, amore ac studio, we engage the transformative power of our differences, cultivating intellectual discovery and informed civic action. Personally, I've often heard students and colleagues refer to the transformative power of our differences. And that embrace of diversity as a source of power is important. And you will be invited to do so throughout today. But right now, I want to emphasize the latter parts of that mission statement. Cultivating intellectual discovery and informed civic action. Intellectual discovery obviously has value in its own right but it has added value when it informs the actions we take to make our communities and our world more just. And engaging in such action can help us avoid a specific danger. When our words signal a commitment to social justice, including my earlier acknowledgement of indigenous elders and elders in chains, there is a danger that by themselves, those words amount to nothing more than empty gestures. But civic action, informed civic action, can give those words meaning. And today, you each have the opportunity to participate in activities that cultivate intellectual discovery in the service of civic action that is well-informed. And as you do so, you will follow in the footsteps of Dr. King. He's widely known for his rhetoric and his action, but before he was a civil rights leader and before he was a minister, he was what each of us will be today, a student, engaged in an intellectual discovery that can inform later civic action. All of you who are sociology majors or who were once sociology majors can take pride in the fact that King's Morehouse College BA was in sociology. And students in sociology, if your families ask what one can do with a sociology degree, well, now you can add Nobel Prize winning civil rights leader to the list of possibilities. After graduating, King went on to Crozier Theological Seminary, and according to political scientist Karuna Montana, it was there that the foundations of King's philosophy of nonviolence were laid. Beginning with a lecture by educator and pastor Mordecai Johnson, a lecture that inspired King to immediately go out and buy half a dozen books on Gandhi just as that lecture by Johnson helped King the student begin informing the civic action of King the leader, I hope today can help you inform your own action. And we are all about to get off to a very interesting and informative start with our keynote address by my fellow social psychologist, Jennifer Eberhardt. Jennifer earned her BA from the University of Cincinnati and ultimately a PhD from Harvard. Since 1998, she has been on the faculty at Stanford University where she is currently a professor of psychology, as well as the Morris M. Doyle Centennial Professor of Public Policy. She's also a faculty co-director of Stanford's SPARC, S-P-A-R-Q, which describes itself not as a think tank, but as a do tank. One that, as its website says, partners with industry leaders to tackle disparities and inspire culture change using insights from behavioral science. As a researcher, Jennifer studies race and human cognition. But she focuses on the ways in which people often mentally associate black Americans with crime. 
and the consequences, as Clayton noted, the consequences of such mental associations, especially within criminal justice. For example, she and her colleagues have used body cam footage to document differences in how police speak to black and white motorists during traffic stops. The first time I met Jennifer was at a conference, but not at a typical academic conference where researchers gather to talk to other researchers. Jennifer had organized a conference at Stanford that brought researchers into conversation with law enforcement leaders, chiefs of police, and sheriffs. The goal was to bring empirical research to bear in efforts to promote more equitable policing. A past co-author of Jennifer's, psychologist Phil Goff, founded the Center for Policing Equity. And at the center, they often refer to themselves by the hashtag, Justice Nerds. For her part, Jennifer has been recognized by the MacArthur Foundation with one of its prestigious fellowships, and based on her research, she has written a recent book, one that Brian Stevenson, attorney and author of the book Just Mercy, called Groundbreaking. So Jennifer is a rightly celebrated justice nerd. And she's here now to deliver a talk titled Biased, Uncovering the Hidden Prejudice that Shapes What We See, Think, and Do. Please join me now in welcoming our keynote speaker, Professor Jennifer Eberhardt. You're a lot taller than me. <laughs> thank you for that very uh, kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you all uh, for coming. Um, today uh, is a day of reflection. Um, as a nation, um, the question is, um, how did we get to this point? Um, just recently, the Pew Research Center released a report which found that six in 10 Americans feel that race relations in this country are generally bad. And a majority of Americans fear that things are getting worse. They fear that we're slipping back in time. As a nation, we're struggling to hang on. And I uh, wrote uh, this book called Bias to begin to speak to that struggle. Um, I wrote um, this book to uh, bring the science of bias to everyday people, to enlist the science um, in our fight for equal justice, to encourage progress and to offer hope. And so I'm here today to talk to you about bias. And although we can have bias about all sorts of groups based on all sorts of characteristics, I want to focus here on race. When the average person thinks about racial bias, they think about burning crosses and people filled with hate. They think of old-fashioned racism. But I'm a social psychologist, and as social psychologists, we know that you don't have to be an old-fashioned racist to be biased. Bias can be triggered and can have devastating impact, even when we're not aware of it, even when we claim that it's our intention to be fair, even when our intention, in fact, is to be fair. During my time here today, I want to demonstrate how racial disparities across a variety of contexts can inspire bias in many people, including us. And that bias can work to sustain and magnify the disparities that are already there. So for the first part of my remarks, I'm going to focus on how bias functions across systems. And for the second part, I will offer tools for disrupting the bias that we see. Now, as an example, I'm going to speak about the black-white uh, dynamic here quite a bit, where the research is most advanced where the disparities are especially extreme, and where those extreme disparities seem to exist in almost every facet of life. So let's take a tour 
of empirical studies. And we're going to start with those studies most relevant to the criminal justice context. As Alex mentioned, although African Americans make up less than 13% of the US population, they make up nearly 33% of the prison population. And that disparity biases us. It changes how we see. And at the root of this process is the stereotypic association between African Americans and crime. With a number of colleagues, I've conducted studies to demonstrate the power of this association. We found that the association of blackness with crime is so strong that it can determine what, which objects we see in the world and which we don't. African Americans are so associated with crime that the mere presence of a black face can cause people to see weapons better. So to examine this, we invited undergraduates into our laboratory to participate in a study. And we had them uh, sit at a computer screen with a focus dot at the center, and they saw flashes of light appear around that focus dot. Now these flashes of young, uh, were actually the faces of young men that were appearing on the screen at such a rapid rate that participants couldn't consciously detect them. So I'm gonna show you the same thing here again in slow motion. We use what we call a subliminal priming procedure to expose our participants uh, either to an entire series of black male faces, we took another group of participants, we exposed them to an entire series of white male faces, and then we took a third group of participants and we exposed them to no faces at all. And then after this procedure, we asked those same participants to perform a supposedly unrelated object recognition task. And for this task, they were presented with a series of objects that were severely degraded. Now, these objects appeared on the computer screen one at a time, and each object was slowly brought into focus in a series of 41 steps or 41 frames. And the participant's goal was to indicate with a button push the moment at which they could recognize what each object was. Now some of these objects were crime relevant, like guns and knives, and others were crime irrelevant, like staplers and cameras and so forth. And we hypothesized that those participants who were primed, who were exposed to uh, black faces, would be better at detecting the crime objects. All right, so what did we find? So along the vertical axis here, you see the frame number at which participants could recognize the object. That's going from frame one where it's blurry to frame 41 where it's completely clear. And the first thing we're gonna do is look at what happened with the crime irrelevant objects. And you could see here that exposure to the faces made absolutely no difference in participants' ability to recognize these cameras and staplers and so forth. They're recognizing those images about the midpoint of the continuum, right? Now, when we look at the crime relevant objects, we get a pattern of results that's altogether different. After simple exposure to black faces, all of a sudden, they need fewer frames. They need less information to tell us what those objects are, okay? Now, Martin Luther King Jr. once said, everything that we see is a shadow cast by that which we do not see. The black faces, which people weren't even aware of, led them to see the weapons more clearly. And we get just the opposite effect with exposure to white faces. People need more clarity. They needed more frames before they could make out what those crime objects were. So exposure to black faces facilitated the detection of crime objects, where exposure to white faces inhibited their detection of those very same objects. Now this particular study was conducted with both white and non-white uh, students, and we found that the race of the study participant didn't matter. We get the same pattern of results regardless of participant race. 
Now, on the next stop of the tour, we're going to take a look at how the Black Crime Association can affect how we act, um, and in particular, how it might affect our decision to shoot. So here, I want to talk to you about research conducted by Josh Carell and colleagues. Uh, some years ago, they designed what they called a shoot-don't-shoot shoot computer simulation. And in this computer simulation, participants saw a series of people, and each person was either holding a gun or they were holding a harmless object. And the participants were told to press a button labeled shoot if they saw a gun, press a button labeled don't shoot if they saw a harmless object. Now, at this point on our research tour, I want to pause and I want to immerse you in the study. I have a number of the slides that they use from this study with participants, and I want to show you the slides. And if you see a person holding a gun, I want you to use your right hand to tap on your lap as quickly as you can. And if you see someone holding a harmless object, I want you to use your left hand to tap as quick, quickly as you can. So it's right hand for um, shoot because there's a gun, left hand for don't shoot because there's no gun. So that means you have to maybe put your papers down or whatever you need to do to tap on your lap would be great. And so we're going to try this out. And um, here you go. OK. Now, I want to explain something here. Now, the whole object um, of this task is to react quickly. <laughs> That's what we're doing here. You're going to respond fast, right? <laughs> and I also want you to tap loud so we can kind of hear what's going on in the space, OK? So I'm going to give you another shot at this. I have a few more of these. There are, there are practice effects, so I'm hoping you'll get better. All right, let's try it again. <laughs> Much better. Oh, is that? OK, no. Uh-oh, uh sorry. It's skipping for some reason. OK. OK, all right. All right, so the, uh, the researchers had participants do this about 80 times. And they found, on average, that people were faster to shoot a black person holding a gun than a white person holding a gun. And they also found that study uh, participants were more likely to mistakenly shoot a black person who held no gun than they were to mistakenly shoot a white person who held no gun. So they found race effects both in terms of the reaction time to shoot and then the actual decision um, they made, uh, they, you know, the error rate. And these effects have been replicated now by several different research teams in different regions of the country. And not only do you get these results with students, but Josh Carell and others have found the same results with community members as study participants. And in fact, they found these same results with black community members. So again, the race of the participant um, in this case seems to make no difference. And this association of blackness with crime makes its way into the courtroom as well. It can affect how we punish. It can even affect death sentencing decisions. In a large data set of death eligible defendants, we found that looking more black more than doubled the chances that those defendants would receive a death sentence at least when their victims were white. And this effect is significant even though we control for factors like aggravators and mitigators and the severity of the crime. We even control for the defendant's attractiveness. And no matter what we controlled for, we found that black defendants appear to be punished in proportion to the blackness of their physical features. The more black, the more death-worthy. This association of blackness uh, and crime not only affects how we perceive faces, it can also affect how we perceive body movement. And how we perceive body movement also matters in the context of crime. Police officers base their suspicions of criminal wrongdoing in part on body motion. 
So at the next stop of the tour, I want to present a study designed to answer a simple question, and that is, to what extent is race related to how officers read body motion? This time, we conducted an archival study that involved data collected by the NYPD on their stop, question, and frisk practices. Now, each time an officer stops someone on the streets of New York City, they're required to complete a form. And on that form, officers have to say why it is they made the stop. So you can see here there are a number of reasons um, they can make a stop, including what they call furtive movement. So what is furtive movement? So it turns out that the department didn't know. There was no agreed upon definition of what furtive movement was. So that left it to individual officers to decide for themselves what was furtive or what was suspicious movement. And so officers could you know, draw the threshold at different points and, and maybe they can um, have a different threshold in different parts of the city and so forth. So it was, um, it was loose, right? It was ambiguous. Um, um, but our question here was how is race related to office, how officers are making uh, these decisions about furtive movement. So in uh, 2010, during the peak of stop and frisk practices in New York, um, NYPD officers made over 600,000 stops. Think about that, 600,000 stops in just one year, right? And they could make these stops for a variety of reasons. Um, and over 300,000 of those 600,000 stops were based on furtive movement. It was by far the number one reason people were stopped on the streets of New York City. So to a big extent, officers were using body movement as a cue to threat and danger and criminal activity. And when we just focus on white and black people who were stopped for furtive movement during the peak of stop and frisk, we found that 88% were black and 12% were white. Next, we looked at racial disparities in treatment after being stopped for furtive movement. And we found that black people were more likely to be um, frisked um, and they were more likely to be subjected to physical force than white people, though they were no more likely to have a weapon. In fact, only 1% of those stopped for furtive movement actually had a weapon. Now, despite all of this, most New Yorkers at the time supported aggressive stop and frisk practices. So why is this? So we were interested in, in sort of what was producing this race effect, and we found in follow-up studies that the more people were reminded of racial disparities in the criminal justice system, that is, the more black they thought the prison population was, the more they thought um, aggressive uh, practices um, like these were necessary to keep order and to stay safe. And this has real implications, right? Think about this. Social activists will often use extreme racial disparities as an indication that the system is broken and as a motivator for us all to do better. Yet because of the racial narratives we have that link black people to inherent criminality, those very disparities can be seen as proof that blacks are criminal. Those very disparities can be seen as evidence that the system is working just fine. Now, I want to um, pause here for a moment um, and tell you a story. Some years ago, my um, son and I were on an airplane. Um, my son was just five years old at the time. And he was so excited about being on this airplane with mommy. He was looking all around, he was checking people out, and he says to me, hey mommy, he says, that guy looks like daddy. And I look at the guy, and he doesn't look anything at all like my husband, like nothing at all, right? So then I start looking around on the plane, right? And I noticed this guy was the only black guy on the plane. And I thought, okay. 
I'm going to have to have a little talk with my son about how not all black people look alike. Right? So I'm thinking, all right, I have to adjust the language a little bit, right, for a five-year-old. And so, so I'm thinking about how I'm going to you know, lecture him on this. But before I said anything to him, you know, I paused and I thought, you know, children see the world in a different way from adults, right? They haven't been conditioned year after year to see people in certain ways. And I thought, well, maybe there is some resemblance there between this guy and my husband that my son can pick up that I'm just missing, right? So I decide I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to look at the guy. I'm looking for any resemblance, right? So first I look at his height and no resemblance there. He's about four inches shorter than my husband. And then I look at his weight. There was no resemblance there. I looked at his facial features, nothing there. Skin color, nothing. I looked at his hair. And this guy had long dreadlocks flowing down his back. And my husband shaves his head. <laughs> and I thought, all right. You know, I looked at my son. I'm like, you're going to get the talk, right? But before I could say anything, my son, he looks up at me and he says, I hope he doesn't rob the plane. And I said, what? What did you say? And he says, well, I hope that guy doesn't rob the plane. And I said, why would you say that? You know daddy wouldn't rob a plane. And he said, yeah, yeah, I know that. And I said, well, why would you say that? And he looked at me with this really sad face. And he said, I don't know why I said that. I don't know why I was thinking that. We're living with such severe racial stratification that even a five-year-old can tell us what's supposed to happen next. Even with no malice, with no hatred. My five-year-old was affected by this association. This black crime association made its way into the mind of my five-year-old. It makes its way into the minds of all of our children and to all of us. My son lives in California. He lives in a state where Less than 6% of the population is black, yet nearly 30% of those incarcerated are black. And those disparities have broad reach. They affect not only how we see black men, they affect how we see their children. Even five-year-olds are caught in the grip. In a recent study by Andrew Todd and colleagues, they found that people associate the faces of black kindergartners with crime. In a laboratory study, they asked people to look at a computer screen and to categorize the objects they saw as either guns or toys, and to do this as quickly as possible. Now, they also saw children's faces on the screen, which they were told to ignore. So I'm going to show you a little demo here of what this looked like. So they saw a child's face, and they were told to just categorize the object they saw as a gun or a toy. Gun or toy, gun or toy, gun or toy. And they found that the mere presence of black children's faces led them to identify the guns more quickly. Bias can move from the prisons to the streets. It can seep into our schools. It can shadow our children as they learn. So the next stop on the tour is the schoolhouse. Here I want to focus on how race might influence how teachers discipline their students. There are racial disparities in the schooling context as well. Black students are more than three times as likely to be suspended or expelled than white students. And close to 70% of those black students who were pushed out of school, they end up in the criminal justice system at some point in their lives. 
Minor infractions are a big reason why teachers discipline students. But to what extent are the disparities we see in the schooling context due to racial bias, as opposed to the possibility that black children are just misbehaving more than white children? So to isolate the causal role of racial bias in all of this, we conducted an online study with practicing teachers from different regions of the country. And we asked them to imagine teaching at a middle school. We then asked them to read an office referral record of a student who misbehaved in some benign way. So for example, they read about a student who was disrupting the class by strolling around and getting tissues out of a tissue box. Half of our teachers read about Greg, a student with a stereotypically white name who was disrupting class in this way. And the remaining half read about a student named Darnell, a student with a stereotypically black name who was misbehaving in the identical way. So this change in names was our race manipulation, and we found that initially the race of the student did not influence how teachers viewed the infraction. So for example, they felt no more irritated or hindered by the student's misbehavior if he were black, and race also had no impact on how uh, they felt the student would be or should be disciplined. But then they read that the same student misbehaved again. They read that this time Greg was sleeping in class and refusing to do work, or they read that Darnell misbehaved in the same way. And here we see huge race effects. The teachers see Darnell's behavior as much more problematic, as more disruptive. Um, they feel more irritated with Darnell, and they want to discipline him more. And not only do they want to discipline him more in the moment, they want to, uh, they, or they can more easily see or imagine suspending him down the road. So why is this, right? So we conducted follow-up studies once again to get at why race was having this effect. And it seemed like when it came to Greg, teachers were more inclined to view the infractions as two isolated incidents. So one had nothing to do with the other. But for, for Darnell, those incidents were related. They were indicative of a pattern of misbehavior that was problematic and that needed to be shut down. So that's why we got the effects we got. After just two strikes, right, two incidents, they saw Darnell as a troublemaker. And this starts early. For example, when researchers at Yale told preschool teachers to watch for children who might cause trouble, they looked at the black children. They showed teachers a video of children sitting around a table playing with toys. No one was, in fact, making trouble. Yet using eye tracking equipment, they found uh, that teachers were looking at the black students for signs of trouble. And they looked at the black boys in particular. So it starts early and it has real implications for the mental uh, well-being of black students and for their ability to achieve in school. Over time, those students worry about how they might be treated in school environments, and those concerns can influence their day-to-day -day interactions with uh, teachers and also their identity as learners. And when those children grow up and they enter the workforce, what do they face? For the final stop, on our tour, I want to look at the workplace. Um, in a now classic study, two economists, Bertrand and Mullenathan, examined the role of race in the US labor market. And so they were looking at entry level positions here, like um, you know, uh, jobs as parking attendants and office clerks and so forth. And they developed 5,000 resumes, um, and they systematically um, varied the race of the applicant um, on those resumes. And they sent the resumes to potential employers who were advertising for jobs in Boston and in Chicago. And they found that those resumes with the black sounding names received 50% fewer callbacks 
from potential employers than resumes, the same resumes, right, um, with white sounding names. Now this particular study was conducted way back in uh, 2004, yet the results have held up over time. In a recent meta-analysis that examined studies like these that were, have been conducted over the last 25 years, uh, we see that African Americans and Latinos continue to receive fewer callbacks. And the results are not limited to the U.S. Researchers have found these same effects uh, with all kinds of disfavored groups in Australia, in Canada, and across Europe. Even students from elite U.S. colleges are concerned about bias in the labor market. Researchers have shown many um, um, African American students and Asian students are attempting to whiten their resumes to appear more acceptable to employers. So for example, Jamal Anthony Smith becomes J. Anthony Smith. Black students will even try to downplay their identity by removing that identity from activities that they were involved in, um, um, in during college. And sometimes they remove the activities altogether, even though they risk not getting credit for the skills that they picked up um, when they were engaging in those activities. Um, and they, they feel that um, there's an even bigger risk to signal their race um, and to present, to present themselves as, as black or too black or as too radical to employers. And get this, the researchers found that their concerns are warranted. Whitened resumes do indeed receive more callbacks than unwhitened resumes. And this is the case even for those employers who state that they care about diversity and inclusion. And it doesn't end there. If they get the interview, they risk having shorter, less positive interviews than white applicants. If they get the job, they risk not being promoted. Bias and concerns about bias are even present when it comes to what businesses people invest in. In fact, uh, with the private investment firm, we've begun looking at the causal role race can play in investment decisions. To examine this, our study participants were professional investors. We presented these investors with one-page descriptions of highly qualified venture capital teams, teams that could help them to manage their investments. And we used photographs to depict the managing partner of each team as either black um, or as white. And we found that investors evaluated highly qualified black-led teams more negatively in terms of their track record, in terms of their expertise, in terms of their ability, again, even though they were seeing the identical credentials. So this lack of diversity in the investment industry may not only be a pipeline problem, it's not just that it's hard to find highly qualified black-led venture capital teams. Those teams are out there and when they show up, they face barriers. In fact, we're finding that the more qualified black-led teams are, the more bias they face. When we look at who is in the investment industry, the racial and gender disparities are about as extreme as you can get. And the question is, how do these disparities feed bias? How might these disparities influence the evaluation of pitches? Who looks too risky? Who looks investment worthy? In this space too, disparity can be self-perpetuating. So what do we do? What do we do when racial bias is all around us in our workplaces, in our schools, in our police departments? I want to argue here that although racial bias can touch our lives in so many ways, we're not doomed to be under its grip. We are all vulnerable to bias but we're not acting on that bias all the time. Instead, bias is triggered by the situations we find ourselves in. As researchers, we know a lot about what those situational triggers are. Responding quickly is a trigger, right? Remember we did the shoot, don't shoot um, computer simulation and I was 
pushing you to go quickly? I was pushing you to go quickly because it's when you go quickly um, that you experience the bias. You don't have time to think. You don't have time to weigh options. You don't have time to think, is that a gun or is that a cell phone? You're forced to rely on these well-practiced automatic associations, right? Uh, and those associations come alive and start to infect your decision-making. They infect your actions. What does that one say? I can't read. <laughs> oh, subjective standards. That's what it says, right? Um, so that's another one, right? So um, when we're using subjective standards to evaluate others rather than objective standards, we're more likely um, to um, have bias affect our decision making. Again, furtive movements, right? I talked about the NYPD use of furtive movements to evaluate the criminal um, wrongdoing of others. That was a subjective standard. They couldn't define it. People didn't know what it was. It left it up to officers to decide what it was, and they could do that in any way they wanted, right? As a result of that, actually, the NYPD um, has removed furtive movements as a, a reason, a sole reason you can pull someone over on the streets of New York City. And the list goes on and on here. Um, uh, lack of accountability. Um, lack of training, lack of positive contact, even the emotions that we feel can influence bias. When we're feeling threatened, when we're under stress, right, bias is more likely um, to get activated. The cultural norms and the space that um, we um, are, are, are living in and working in and so forth can influence bias. Even when you cherish being egalitarian, if you're in a space that has weak norms, weak egalitarian norms, your behavior can start to move towards um, that norm despite um, your own values because we're social creatures, right? Um, we are, we, we're affected uh, by our environment. Okay, um, now, I focused uh, quite a bit on African Americans here, but these situational triggers are at work regardless of the group that is targeted by bias. And they're at work not only within us as individuals, they're at work within the systems that we build. So I want to give you an example of this. How many people are familiar um, with um, the uh, tech company next door? Okay, so some people, not, not, not that many people actually. Well, well, their whole purpose is to help to create stronger and healthier and uh, safer neighborhoods by creating this online space where neighbors can gather and they can share information with one another. Yet they soon discovered that they had a problem with racial profiling on their platform. In the typical case, People would look out their window and they would see a black man in an otherwise white neighborhood and they would report him as suspicious, even when there was no evidence that he was engaged in criminal wrongdoing. So the co-founder of Nextdoor, Sarah Leary, reached out to me and others to try to figure out what to do and they poured through the literature on bias and they found that they were going to have to slow people down in, in order to curb profiling on the platform. Now, this presented another dilemma for them because, you know, they are trying to produce and sell a tech product, right? Um, and tech products are not about slowing people down at all, right? Um, in fact, um, they use the word friction. It, it, it's as a bad word in the tech industry. You don't want friction. You don't want people to slow down. Right? You want them to use the products um, seamlessly. Um, you want the products to be you know, fluid, uh, intuitive. They want people to be able to use these products without thinking. But these are the very conditions under which bias can get activated and influence our decision making. So they had to decide what to do. And they decided that they were going to intentionally introduce friction even though uh, it could lead to a drop-off on the website where, or, or, or the platform where people wouldn't use it anymore. And so they did this, they introduced friction by creating a checklist. 
And uh, it was a three item checklist. And the first item on that checklist was um, asking people to state uh, the, beh uh, the behavior. What was the person doing um, that made him suspicious? So it couldn't be the person's social category. It couldn't be a black man, right? It had to be somebody who was actually engaged in um, uh, suspicious behavior. The second item on that checklist will ask people to describe a person's individual features, not just describe the person in terms of their social ca category. And then the third item on the checklist was to define what um, racial profiling was. That one was interesting to me. People actually didn't know, a lot of them didn't know what the definition of profiling was, nor that they were engaging in it. So they defined it, and then they also um, said that, you know, this is a behavior that's prohibited on the platform. So that what they were going after, you guys have seen um, these uh, signs at airports and things, if you see something, say something. So they were trying to modify this, so it's, if you see something suspicious, say something specific. Right? And they found that by simply slowing people down, by introducing friction, they were able to reduce profiling by over 75% on their platform. Now, people often say to me, well, you can't add friction, you can't slow people down in any context, you know, especially for people, you know, they're like police officers who are making these split second decisions. But it turns out that we can add friction to more situations than we think. So uh, working with the Oakland Police Department in California, I and a number of my colleagues were able to help the department to reduce the number of stops they made of people who were not committing any serious crimes. And uh, we did this by simply forcing officers to ask themselves a question before each and every stop they made. And that question was, is this stop intelligence-led, yes or no? Okay, so what did they mean by intelligence-led? Turns out they didn't know either, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we had to get you know, to a definition everybody agreed on. And so that definition ended up being, um, you know, basically, uh, did you have intelligence before the stop you know, that linked this uh, particular person to a specific crime, right? And if they did determine that the stop was intelligence-led, they had to name the source of that intelligence, where, you know, where the in intelligence came from. So by simply adding that checkbox to the form officers complete during the stop, they slow down, they pause, they think, why am I considering pulling this person over? And we found that in, in 2017, um, the Oakland police officers made around 32,000 stops. In 2018, with the addition of this intelligence-led box, they made around 19,000 stops. African-American stops alone fell by 43%. And this drop happened even as the crime rate continued to fall. So how did this intervention work? Well, we slowed them down. We changed the standard um, they were using to evaluate others by pushing them to use evidence of wrongdoing in place of intuition. We increased accountability by introducing a, a metric uh, to track intel-led stops for the first time. And then the department defined what an intelligence-led stop was and then trained officers on how to spot it. And then the police leadership incentivized these kinds of stops. So not only do we have individual tools at our disposal to curb bias, we can package these tools together in different ways to produce better outcomes. In the dom domain of education, researchers have found that slowing teachers down and training um, so we have trouble with the remote here, and, and, and training them to become more empathetic to students uh, when they misbehave can reduce the suspension rate. And they do this by redirecting uh, teachers um, to broaden their focus. Uh, they lead them to think not only about the student's um, misbehavior in the moment, but what is producing that misbehavior. So teachers think about the kinds of experiences and worries that could lead a child to feel mistrust and therefore to misbehave. 
And then teachers provide examples of how um, they could discipline a child in a manner that, con that could convey uh, concern for the child or in a manner that could pull that child into the community rather than pushing them further away. So this intervention is grounded in the science of relationship building. And using this simple technique, uh, the researchers were able to cut the suspension rate in half. And not only this, those students who had just one teacher who went through this exercise viewed their teachers in general as more respectful and they trusted them more. And this was the case even for students who had been suspended before. Now, um, I've been working with some of those same researchers to develop an intervention for high school students who have been um, pushed into the juvenile justice uh, system and are attempting to return to high school. And for this intervention, we get um, students this time to focus on their values. Oh, sorry. This, um, okay. We get students to focus on their values um, and what they would like to achieve at the school uh, right at the point of reentry. And we ask them to name an adult who could uh, be supportive of them. And we ask each student uh, what they would want this trusted adult to know about them. We tell the students that uh, we, may, we might be able to share some of their th thoughts with this trusted adult. And then for half of the students, we write a letter to that trusted adult telling them about this student's reentry. In the student's own words, uh, we share what that student wanted the adult to know about them. So what happened? We found uh, that about 70% of the students who were not in our intervention recidivated. So they went back to the juvenile um, uh, justice system. And um, we found that about 63% of those students who uh, got the intervention um, went back to juvenile detention. But for those who got the intervention and that trusted adult received the letter, only 29% recidivated. Those students Despite their hopes and dreams, they needed help to re-enter. They needed the power of just one adult in that system to commit to taking their hand, guiding them, shielding them, believing in them. We tried this uh, as a pilot study with a small sample of just 47 students in Oakland, but now we're trying to scale it up. And the plan is to try it in different school communities in different regions to see if the results hold. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through the continuous struggle. And King went on to say that every step toward the goal of injustice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. The tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. Fully comprehending the pervasive power of bias does not make us less responsible. It makes us more responsible. So you ask, what can we do? We now know that we have many mitigation tools at our disposal, not only to fight bias, we have tools we can use to fight the mere threat of bias. We have tools we can use to repair broken relationships. And we can use these tools in our own individual lives, in our institutions, our police departments, our schools, our corporations, can use these same tools to make sure that everyone in the system can thrive and reach their potential. So there's a lot of power in just the simple things. And we want to keep up the fight at this level, even as we take aim at the harder things. As, as a society, we want to take aim at the racial narratives that keep people anchored at the bottom of society. We want to take aim at the structural disparities that those narratives produce and that those narratives reflect. And that's a much heavier lift. Yet in this too, we can all take part. In this book, I uh, take everyday people on a journey. 
And everywhere they go, readers not only discover scientific ideas about the human mind and how bias works and what it all means, they meet people. They meet people who are struggling and fighting. They meet people like Tiffany Crutcher, whose twin brother was shot and killed by a police officer in Tulsa, Oklahoma, several years ago. Tiffany responded to that pain by dedicating her life to police reform. They meet Bernice Donald, who was one of a handful of black students to desegregate an all-white high school in Olive Branch, Mississippi in the 1960s. She endured horrific discrimination from students and teachers alike. Yet she emerged as the first black woman in the entire state of Tennessee to serve as a judge. And she later was appointed to the US Court of Appeals. They meet Campbell, a white southerner, a student at the University of Virginia, who went to battle with white supremacists on the streets of Charlottesville. They came to start a race war, yet there Campbell stood, defending the campus, defending the town, defending the egalitarian values that this country is still striving to embrace. Readers meet these people and more. Regular people out in the world rising up to do extraordinary things. So uh, we've reached the end of our time together, but before we depart, I wanna leave you with the final story. This is a story about my own experience. It's about my own attempt to contribute in some small way. I was an instructor at San Quentin State Prison I had been at Stanford at that point for about 12 years, but here I stood in front of a class at San Quentin uh, for the very first time. It was a small class of just about 30 inmates or so, and just as I had done for years at Stanford on that first day of class, I asked students to um, introduce themselves and to say why it is they wanted to take the class. Now, some of their responses were similar to what I had heard from Stanford students across the years. We thought the course would be interesting. They needed the credit to fulfill the requirement. A lot of people know about that. <laughs> Yet I also heard reasons for taking the course that I'd never heard before. For example, one man was worried that his daughter was depressed. And he was hoping that by taking a psychology course, he'd be able to be there for her, to help her through it, to support her. Then another man spoke. He was in his mid-40s or so. And he said to me, you know, I already know a lot about how things work up here inside San Quentin. And he said to me, I'm taking this class because I want to know how free people think. He had been incarcerated since he was 14 years old. He spent his entire adult life behind bars, and he was desperate to understand how his imprisonment had warped his view of the world. And I was standing before him sh shackled by the perceptions of a society that would dehumanize and discard a 14-year-old. It struck me that we were both there to move a little closer to freedom. And since that time, it struck me that so many of us are trying to move closer to freedom. So this book, attempt, for me, attempts to chart a path forward. You know, I'd like, uh, I wrote the book to try to contribute to shifting the conversations we're having about race and inequality in this country so that we don't slip back in time, so that we remain hopeful, so that we continue to strive to see one another and ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's not every day that a researcher gets a standing ovation. <laughs> it means a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Eberhardt, thank you for that wonderful, extraordinary, informative, intriguing presentation. Everyone, let's give her one more round of applause. <laughs> My role is very brief. I just have a couple of announcements for the workshops that will begin at 10.45. The workshop today is scheduled for Hedge Hall have been moved to other locations. Those notices will be posted in Pettengo Hall and on the doors of Hedge Hall. And secondly and lastly, I compliment and um, just thrilled by the turnout this morning. And I encourage everyone to take the words and inspirations they've heard this morning to participate fully in the workshops of the day and the programs of this evening. Thank you very much and have a great day.